Interesting. Welcome to our evening in conversation, uh, Seven Centuries of Climate Change in Print. And um, I'm just going to start by uh, recommending to live stream viewers who are watching this on their um, on Zoom. Uh, we recommend that you change your settings in your Zoom window by using the menu in the top right hand corner of the screen and choose hide non video participants. And that means that you will see the speakers spotlighted for the duration of the event and uh, you'll be able to watch it much better that way. Now we've got a change to the advertised lineup. Unfortunately, Dr. Catherine Barnard, who's CEO of the World Land Trust, is unwell and she can't be with us uh, this evening. In her place, we have Dan Bradbury, who is Director of Brand and Communications for the World Land Trust. And he has over a decade of experience in raising the profile of the cons conservation work that the Trust and its international partners carry out around the world. The rest of our panel is made up of Emma Walsh, who's a specialist at Peter Harrington, and she works on the climate collection and uh, on our screens. Uh, dialing in from Florida, we have Dave Wenner, who is a prolific American collector, and he curated the core portion of scientific papers in our collection, 100 Seconds to Midnight. We also have Fred Pierce. Fred is a science writer and environmental reporter. He worked for many years at the New Scientist magazine. And he's also the author of a number of books on environmental and development issues. So that's our panel. Um, and we're going to be exploring um, the One Seconds to Midnight collection. And um, so the first question would be to Emma is, uh, <laughs> why, why did we want to assemble such a collection? How did it all begin? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in 2019, we were looking, Peter Harrington, uh, as a company to work on a slightly larger, more uh, long-term project. We, we wanted to build a collection. And at the time, as it had been in years previous and as it has since become even more obvious, but climate was very much at the forefront of the news. Uh, if you remember, we'd had the Australian wildfires, we'd had uh, the typhoons and the cyclones. Um, and we had had sort of all these responses to the Paris Agreement, but with very little uh, galvanized effort to move beyond and to actually fulfill the promises that we made. Um, and by the end of 2019, the Oxford Dictionaries uh, had climate emergency as their word or phrase of the year, uh, which sort of, yeah, that outlined where we were in 2019. And from our perspective, we were looking for a slightly different subject, something that we hadn't covered in our stock to a great extent before. So climate change with it being such a prevalent issue, but also being fresh to us. Um, we thought it was a good opportunity to tackle something slightly different and to work towards building a collection that was sort of descriptive, but also explorative in terms of the subject matter that we could cover and the points that we could make as well. So that was sort of how we approached it as a contemporary issue, but one that we felt could be traced back in history um, and our specialism is print history so we thought why not start at the beginning of print so yeah okay and um so those things at the at the beginning of print are they mm. uh when did it first come to when, when does the climate when change sort kick of off? yes so. so when we were assembling the collection um I was very much thinking about it as a chronological progression and then you will talk later in the panel about how actually you can break off from that and talk about different pockets of history that have lots of different connections outside of just from A to B. But um, one printing press. Um, it's a beautifully produced book. It is on the table there, um, so I can show members of the audience here later. Um, uh, and it's it's beautiful, and it's one of the earliest weather forecasts ever printed. Um, and we use that as an anchoring point to show that 
actually modern climate studies have their origins in these early attempts to forecast weather, to predict patterns. So that's what we took as our starting point with reference to classical authors like Aristotle, whose meteorology is another foundational text. And that's where we sort of rooted everything. And then I can give a brief chronological overview of the collection if you'd like, Adam, if that does that sound like a good idea at this point? Um, so, so that's where we started in the 15th century. Um, and then the collection grew from there as we went sort of century by century, piecing together this development of thought around meteorology, weather, prediction. Um, so in the 16th and 17th centuries, what I became interested in was how that understanding of, of weather and prediction became something that we could then apply, we could see an impact from. So for example, uh, 17th century discussions about the impact of climate on human health, of our impact on climate, although at the time that was quite nascent, so it doesn't become a much stronger link until later on. Um, in the 17th century in particular, the sort of the rise of interest in the problems that come from uh, some of our actions. So things like the early conservation works, uh, of deforestation from enclosure acts, um, of really the beginning of fossil fuel extraction. So one of the great texts in the collection is from 1665, and that's the earliest printed record of an account showing that uh, raw coal was being used to manufacture iron. That's sort of the beginning of industrialization much further um, back than I, I personally had really conceived of it as a, a mostly 19th century uh, phenomenon that had roots before, but this really shows that it was being recorded and studied as a method, um, you know, in the mid 17th century. So with that in mind, we kept going forward and we looked at, you know, using those quite local texts in the 18th century to become slightly more cognizant of a larger world, of a larger perspective on this. So that's when a lot of new technologies um, meant that measurements for predicting weather patterns and for compiling data became much more uh, precise. Uh, it was sort of the age of invention and so on. So um, that really influenced how the history took shape from there. We get a huge deluge of material that starts to chart more empirically the, the data that is, is coming in. And one of the figures within that, who moves into the 19th century, that we highlight in the collection is Alexander von Humboldt, um, who is a very famous figure, will be, will be uh, well known to lots of you. And we positioned him as a sort of, I guess, a crux point in, in our understanding of climate within the collection, because he is credited by many as the first person to really conceive of a human-induced climate change. Not only that, but that climate was not separate parts of a whole, but was in fact this quite intrinsically linked uh, concept that everything operated with a reciprocal relationship between things. And so if you affected one thing, you affected something else. And that idea of an ecosystem was really quite uh, new at the time and is something that is seen very powerfully in his writings. So that's sort of a tipping point. And then we followed you know, his ideas through the 19th and 20th centuries. And this is when we start to become more familiar with it as a history. You have the rise of industrialization. You have the artistic responses on how pollution will affect the art that we produce or how um, you know, the birth of environmental literature in the late 19th century and right through to some of the key texts of the 20th century how they become staples of not only uh, environmental literature, but also become really key in disseminating the climate science that builds up in the 19th century as authors start to think, OK, we have all this data, but how do we disseminate this message? And that becomes quite a, an important driving force, I think, in some of the not just nonfiction, but the fiction, which is why the collection includes um, a strong component of sort of surrounding environmental 
fiction, uh, which is often called climate fiction or cli-fi now, and we can return to that later, okay. but uh, cli-fi, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, so the 20th century part of the collection tries to look at a bit more of a call and response uh, sort of concept, I guess, which is this idea that as scientific discoveries were being made, as these very important pieces of data were being uh, collected into landmark articles, there was also an artistic response. There was a <clears throat> political response. There was a, you know, for every piece of data, there was a protest movement that did something with that. But there was a sort of, you know, a larger concept of, of the movement that could be seen as you pull all of these different pieces together. Um, so from starting in 1485, the latest works in the collection are from 2021. Um, and some of them around that era you'll be very familiar with, Greta Thunberg speeches, uh, the first book published by Extinction Rebellion, Bill Gates's book, um, and upcoming, yet to be published, but this year the most uh, recent IPCC reports will come out. And as soon as they're out, they'll be added to the collection. So. That sounds like an incredible amount of work. So uh, and I think you maybe had some help, but it's kind of an yeah, accelerant absolutely. to this whole collection. Who's yeah. Dave Wenner? So how did you first connect up with uh, with Dave? Um, so this, yeah, it was perfect timing, really, because um, we were about a year into the project as it stood. And I had a timeline together, but I was finding it quite tricky to plug certain gaps, particularly on the science uh, component, because some of the papers were just so tricky to pin down. They didn't necessarily um, circulate in the trade and so on. And so we met Dave um, in 20, late 2019, I believe, um, and we were able to meet over Zoom in 2020, sadly not in person because of COVID restrictions, but um, it was a perfect match in my opinion because um, he was able to provide this wonderful scientific backbone to the collection and had been collecting for you know, many, many years and had so many of the papers that I was looking for, which I was very relieved and happy to see. So, um, and not only did we benefit from his material, but we also benefited um, from his knowledge that he brought to it, um, from, from the subject matter that he, he knows so well. So it was a definite learning experience on that side as well. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, Dave, if I can ask you, um, what is your um, work as a collector of climate science? What has that uh, led you to con conclude about the major historical drivers behind climate change? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to keep this at a fairly high level. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, for one reason is that I haven't had the collection in front of me for some period of time and uh, memory's not perfect. But the other is uh, I think it's important to sort of really understand where the various drivers of uh, climate change come into play and how important they are. So I'm just going to stay at a very high level. The first thing I'd like to do, though, is I'd like to clear up one terminology question. Uh, the term ice age has been used in a number of different ways. Um, and the technical definition of it is whenever there are glaciers uh, and that the absence of glaciers is called a greenhouse period. Uh, the term that uh, I use for periods of time when uh, glaciers are growing in other words, it's colder and the glaciers are getting bigger and, 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 and more of them. Uh, I call glacial periods and then interglacial periods are when the glaciers are melting, and but we still have them. So we have ice ages versus greenhouse periods. And then we have within ice ages, we have uh, glacial periods and interglacial periods. A couple of factoids uh, to start with. Um, I think it's generally recognized that there were five major ice ages over the last two billion years. Uh, those have been reasonably well documented. When you go back two billion years, it's hard to be sure. Uh, but then each of the, those ice ages had many uh, glacial and interglacial changes. And we're currently in an interglacial period in what was a, has been a 34 million year ice age. Uh, and so things were warming. Uh, and gl uh, glaciers were melting. 
Um, but nature was heading us toward a glacial period, an inter, uh, so that we would have actually been cooling, except uh, then greenhouse effect took effect, it took over. Uh, and I like to think of this as one of uh, the world's greatest ironies. It's one of the few times that mankind has triumphed over mother nature, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, th with those terms and, and ba basic factoids in, in hand, uh, let me just talk a little bit from the high level, what determines client, uh, climate, excuse me. Um, there's an equation that uh, is basically energy balance equals heat in from the sun minus heat out to outer space. So if, if climate is going to stay constant, then energy balance is going to be zero. So the, the energy that's coming in is being radiated out at the same speed. Um, and there are drivers for each of these that I'd like to uh, explore because that takes you to the things that are important for, for climate. Uh, the first factor is changes in heat received from the sun. Um, and the sun, not many people know this, but scientists, or, or physicists know this, the sun has been warming up. Uh, it's going through its normal cycle of uh, burning hydrogen and then helium. And so it's like 40% warmer than it was when the earth was formed four billion years ago. But that change is so slow that it really doesn't affect climate change much in the 100 million, 200 million year range. But it sure changed it over 4 billion years. Uh, what does change climate over a shorter period of time from having to do with the sun is how far the Earth is from the sun and what the tilt of the Earth's axis is. The Earth's orbit does change periodically. Uh, its axis both uh, wobbles and precesses, which means going around. Uh, and that's been uh, studied in great depth by uh, someone came named Milan Milankovic. Uh, and it's called Milankovitch cycles. This type of climate change has uh, affected the movement between ice ages and doesn't, excuse me, has not affected the movement between ice ages and greenhouse periods, but it has moved us between glacial and interglacials. And in fact, that's what was going to be moving us toward the glacial period before climate change or uh, the greenhouse effect took over. Uh, the second factor uh, is more important to this discussion, which is the heat loss to space and what keeps the heat in the Earth and trapped in the Earth so it doesn't get lost in space. First of all, some of the sun's energy is reflected by clouds and ice and, and uh, water, and the rest warms the Earth's surface. Uh, what happens when the Earth's surface gets warm is that it ray radiates in the infrared spectrum. That's very long wavelengths, it's called radiant heat. Um, and it turns out that trace amounts of greenhouse gases absorb this heat. Water is also a greenhouse gas, it's not trace, but it's driven by carbon dioxide primarily and several other trace gases. So what happens is uh, when the, the heat radiates from the ground up, it's absorbed by these gases and then re-radiated because everything that's warm radiates. And that goes to other parts of the uh, other molecules of gas and so on. Some of it goes back down to earth. Anyway, it takes a long time to get out of the earth's atmosphere, much longer than it would be if it just radiated outward uh, without anything in, in between. Give you a kind of an example. I didn't know this until recently, but um, if you take the center part of the sun where the fusion is taking place and a, uh, a, a, a bit of I, a bit of excuse me a bit of light that comes from there takes something like 40,000 years to keep bumping its way out of the uh, sun's uh, atmosphere and to come to earth so this is not an unusual thing I didn't realize that that was also true for the, to the for the sun now um, the the climate uh, is, governed by a, uh, some, this, excuse me, this, this um, greenhouse gases uh, and the amount of get greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are governed by something called the carbon cycle. In fact, there are three of them, different lengths. One of them is 
uh, when, you, when we breathe out, the plants breathe in and so on. The second one is between the ocean and the atmosphere. The ocean actually has more carbon in it than the atmosphere does. And depending on temperature, it either gives it off or takes it in. And the third is something called carbonite silicate, which is uh, silicate rock. It's uh, uh, rain on it, which has got some carbon, uh, uh, carbonic acid in it. It dissolves it, it runs into the oceans. The oceans turn it into shells. It goes down into the bottom of the ocean, finally comes back up again. That's a million, millions of year cycle. But anyway, those three cycles work together actually to mitigate changes in the, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of, of these trace gases that are in the atmosphere. So for example, if you happen to have higher carbon dioxide, that would lead to more plant growth, which then photosynthesis will help turn it back into oxygen. It'll lead to more ocean absorption um, and greater carbon sequestration through uh, acid rain on silicate rocks. So that's a natural um, regulator, if you would. So that's why climate doesn't change very often and doesn't change rapidly very often at all. But when it does, a major shock can cause a, tripping, a, a tipping point. And that's the, uh, the thing that, that really causes ma major uh, climate change. Um, the tipping points are um, reached when uh, things like a lot of warming leads to the release of carbon sequestration and permafrost. So you get a lot more carbon dioxide released that was you know, maybe sequestered over millions of years. Glaciers melt. Uh, glaciers reflect sun back better than water does. So that would tend to uh, raise the temperature. And then um, at some point, actually stratocumulus clouds disappear. And they're the ones that reflect a lot of the light back from uh, the cloud cover. So you can get a major change in climate and it can happen fairly quickly. Now, um, what could cause this kind of a shock that, that, that's necessary? There are two root causes uh, and only two that up till now. One of them, as I understand it, is uh, something to do with tectonic plate movements. Um, this may be going into more than you wanted to hear, but uh, all of our continents are, are over tectonic plates. They're hard plates and they move. They move through sea floor spreading and they move the continents around many, many times, but sometimes they collide. And when they collide, a couple of things can happen. One is that they can create a mantle plume, which causes lots and lots of volcanic eruption. One example of this is something called the Siberian Traps, uh, which happened to be a, a volcanic eruption that stayed on for 2 million years. And you can imagine how much carbon dioxide might be released by that. So when something like that happens, it can have a major impact on climate. Second uh, thing is an opposite effect it might have when the plates clash, they may create a new mountain. An example of this is the Himalayan mountains were created about 50 million years ago. When you create a mountain, you create a lot more um, uh, uh, buried uh, uh, land that uh, you can then use. The silicate can then be turned into uh, shells in the ocean, and that increases the uh, amount of, of uh, excuse me, decreases the amount of carbon dioxide. So uh, th that's the first major thing. When one of those things happens, like uh, Himalayan mountains, in a million years later, it may change something. Uh, the uh, the same the time frames in uh, uh, in climate change have been very very long. The second major change is something that can happen very quickly, and that is the large impact of um, of a, an asteroid or large body with the Earth. Um, you can imagine uh, what that does. That that it scoops up a lot of uh, dust, which then clouds across the sun, which causes a cooling, and then it also uh, creates a lot of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's been put into the ground, and that then causes warming. When something like that happens, it can cause climate change. And a good example of this um, is that uh, there's a, there was a, uh, an, an impact of a, a of, a, of a meteorite called the Chicxulub impact, uh, which took place 65 million years ago. It was uh, about six miles wide. It hit uh, on the Yucatan Peninsula, 
uh, and created a hundred uh, mile cross crater. Uh, some people have said it had the power of 10 billion Hiroshima type A bombs. And that caused a nuclear winter kind of, or, or actually an impact winter and then much warmer period of time, which killed all the dinosaurs. Uh, so those are the two things that can have a major effect. So just to end up and summarize, climate change is driven by uh, imbalances in the energy equation. It tends to remain stable most of the time. There are two root causes of the most significant shocks, the movement of tectonic plates that can have those two effects that I mentioned and the impact of large meteorites. By the way, uh, the last one hit 13,000 years ago, 13 million years ago, um, and they hit about every 10 million years. So we could be in for one. I hope not. Um, we, hope that, we hope that mankind's uh, addition of uh, fossil fuels is, doesn't become a third major cause of a major climate change. Anyway. Dave, I just wanted to uh, chip in here and say that um, I, I should have perhaps mentioned that uh, people watching this on Zoom, please do feel free to uh, chip in with questions on chat. And um, if there are things that Dave's mentioned that uh, require explanation, then we can deal with those uh, later in the uh, in the session, um, if that's OK. So it sounds like there are various scientific strands like geology, meteorology. These are the kind of things that are reflected in the scientific papers that you collected, Dave, is that right? That's correct. Um, th th I, we can go into this later if there's time, but I, I'll just say there were two major uh, thrusts, uh, be both beginning in the early 1800s. One that was geological in nature and, and started by uh, the discovery that there was an ice age sometime in the past. And the other was uh, work that was uh, begun by Joseph Fourier had to do with the greenhouse effect. And those went on in parallel. And I, I've covered both of those uh, mm. with documents uh, in some detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Emma, you then, I, I, you've, you've sort of added some human, uh, you know, the human reaction to the scientific angles that uh, Dave's been talking about there. So, you know, in the collection, you've got various parties responding to climate change through art and fiction. What are those? Yeah. So I think something that we were able to do was was sort of add to the story, broaden it, bring it into different subjects so that it became a really interdisciplinary collection. Um, and so that you could start to see connections being made between uh, fields that might previously have seemed quite disparate, but are in fact connected by either a love for nature or an anxiety about the environment. Um, so I, I can give a couple of examples of sort of areas in the collection where you start to get this um, interaction between the science and the arts. Um, so for example, I, I mentioned Humboldt before and Cosmos, perhaps his most famous work, um, you know, that he was a, a very highly esteemed geographer and the scientific data that he accumulated was so important to our, you know, even continuing our current understanding of the world. Um, but what he did and then what subsequently uh, artists and writers did with that knowledge is, is really interesting. So he himself was very well known for being, his works were described as being the very poetry of geography. So the idea that they were not just laying out the data, but we're doing something with it. We're trying to convey something, a story there. And then, you know, the, when Cosmos comes out in the 1840s through to the, the next decade, and he the, rever, the reverberations of that are seen then, say, for example, in the American Transcendentalists. So you get uh, texts which we'll all know, like uh, Whitman's Leaves of Grass, that was composed with a copy of Cosmos on Whitman's desk. Um, you have Emerson's Nature, you have a cycle of Poe's poems, and they were dedicated to Humboldt. Um, you also have uh, sort of, yeah, uh, Whitman, um, I mentioned Whitman, but also Thoreau, Walden. These are all texts that are infused with the scientific discoveries that you see in Cosmos. Um, so that's sort of one nice 19th century pocket that links the two. Um, I could think of another couple. I think later 19th century, the uh, sort of the rise of industrialization, um, there's quite a neat uh, link in the connection between 
um, the science at the time. So, for example, Robert Angus Smith, who coined the term, discovered and then coined acid rain as a term. Um, and he was doing a lot of the legislation at the time on factory pollution and so on. So you have him working in 1859, 1860 on that, just as you have John Ruskin, William Morris writing about the same problem, but from a different angle. So uh, Ruskin talks in the storm cloud and of the 19th century about the effect that, um, that pollution, air pollution particularly will have on art and what it looks like on what we create now and what that will end up being as a legacy. And Morris also says, he sort of posits the question in, in his essay on the beauty of the earth. He says, you know, shall we have art or dirt? And he's making that, that sort of distinction between the two. And that's, again, another nice link between art and science and the discoveries of the time and the consequences. And maybe a, a more recent example, and certainly text that um, you'll, you'll have recognized is this idea of fiction mirroring the anxieties that are present in some of the of the, the studies, the, the climate science studies that come out. So, for example, in the 1960s, you have, you know, you have a lot of very important papers talking about climatic change, talking about um, the impact of this data. You have the first uh, paper to present in 1965, the concept that climate change was going to become a serious political issue, the first paper that presents that to the White House. But also in the 1960s, you have Ballard writing The Drowned World and The Drought and the crystal world, you have Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. So there's a lot of different conversations there that I think in a collection of this scope, bringing together the two strands, you start to see the connections that perhaps might otherwise have been kept separately. And, and that was something that was particularly exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, there is in the later in the 20th century, basically, that's uh, in the collection, there was a lot of uh, uh, very striking uh, ephemera related to protests calling for greater awareness of the of the human impact on the environment. Um, you've got some of the earliest Earth Day posters and present day posters, and you've got publications by people like where well, you mentioned Bill Gates before, but Greta Thunberg <laughs> and organizations such as Extinction Rebellion and the IPC. So if I can turn to you, Dan, um, uh, can, can you give us your idea? How important is this environmental, this this activism in the trajectory of understanding climate change, the general awareness of it? Um, I think is look, environmental activism by by definition is about collective response to something. Mm. So, and we're not going to make those changes unless we have a collective response. So. Raising this awareness, you know, the likes of Extinction Rebellion, really kind of raising the profile, you know, whether you agree with some of their tactics or not, but raising the profile of an issue, they've done an incredible job of doing that. You know, and I think is, and we've shown that in various stages, we've in various different times, we've shown that actually a collective response can make a difference. So if we talk about the ozone layer, we were talking about this earlier. So um I can't even remember when it was, it was around 90s, when the early 90s, when, when we started to talk about that. But now, because we've taken that on board and we made that accessible to people and people could understand that, actually, I think it's 99% of those ozone depleting substances are now no longer used. Um, we've seen it more recently with plastics. We've seen the ra rising of the pro or the raising of the profile of the issues around plastic. You know, and we've started to see change and we started to see a different di people's different understanding of that and their approach to, to, you know, I've got a 13 year old daughter who's really militant about it, you know, and I think that's, you know, and there's there's a lot of anxiety that you talked about, certainly in that age group as well, as well about what can they do and what can we do. So ultimately, we need to have a collective response, response to, to whatever we're trying to achieve, you know, and we have to keep, you know, and cop. COP26 and 2021 is this kind of landmark year, I suppose, that people have talked about for climate and climate change, you know, and I think is, and we saw a lot of pledges that were made at COP26, some of them that were made a few years before as well mm -hmm. in 2014, but nothing's really changed, is that now 
we need everybody to kind of get on board and really start to tackle this yeah. and we can't just let it drop you know we we see these different waves so you know again we were talking earlier on downstairs about the ozone layer you know that change and then that kind of dropped off and then we saw the this rise of plastic in recent times and that seems to have dropped a little bit as well but certainly in the last two years last you know we've seen a real real change in narrative around climate and what we need to do about it and how we need to act really quickly mm -hmm. okay and uh fred do you think what do you think about the uh, how important it is to know i mean this is one of the goals of the collection is to reveal as it were the long tail of modern uh, environmental activism and uh, do you think that's helpful for us to to realize how long we've been chipping away at these issues and trying struggling to understand them well i think it is i mean we have a um sort of philosophically we we've developed over quite a long period of time but perhaps particularly over the last 200 years this idea of humans being kind of at odds with nature it's humans destroying nature humans fighting nature this is kind of duality mm -hmm. um which is very interesting um and helps us to understand that the effect that we're having on on the environment but it's potentially damaging because we're losing sight of the kind of synergy you know the way we can live with we do uh, are part of the environment you know we're not separate from the environment we're part of it and i think what we're going to have to do as we go into what we now start calling the anthropocene is is find ways of reconnecting with nature using nature using the resources that nature has provided without it um without without destroying it um and reach an accommodation with it if you like mm -hmm. But what strikes me, I mean, looking through all the material is how, I mean, I kind of knew this, but you, you see it again, how recent the issue of climate change is. There's a lot of literature about, about climate and our fears about climate and weird weather and that kind of stuff. And we blame it on the stars and we blame it on the gods and we blame it on almost anything except ourselves. And for most of that time, that was, you, you know, it's correct. You know, humans weren't changing the climate until really very recently. So it's, it's, it's come at us in a, at a huge rush. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, you know, I, when I was firstly writing about environment issues in the, in the 1980s, the top, the top issue was acid rain. Mm -hmm. That was, well, we, we'd, had, we'd had urban smogs. So we thought the smogs are getting really bad. So we're going to have tall chimneys from power stations and burn our coal in there. And, and then we realized that the, all, all, the, all the pollution was simply going up onto the Pennines or going to Norway or Sweden. So we had these great, in, in the 80s, concern about acid rain. And then we discovered about the ozone layer and how we were destroying the ozone layer, which was new chemicals we'd only been producing for a few decades. And it really wasn't until the 1990s that climate change rose to the top of the environmental agenda and some and it was it was climate change it's we really are changing the climate and we could see it um and so so climate wasn't sort of background thing that was sort of going mm. on that we had to react to and you know look out for and so on it was something which we're actively changing on a really big scale <laughs> so it really is very very recent and that i mean that's depressing because mm. it will you know this is coming out as really fast but it also means that we're in the early stages of reaching solutions and if you want me to try and be optimistic mm -hmm. you know I, I have pessimistic Please. days and optimistic <laughs> days um and but on my optimistic days I see how fast we've come you know if you'd asked me when I went to the earth summit um 30 years ago nobody was talking about really about solar panels and wind turbines and things as the way we were going to get most of our energy in just a few years and yet suddenly we are mm -hmm. so we're finding these technical fixes we're finding ways of thinking about climate we're talking about net zero even five years ago nobody was talking about net zero mm -hmm. now not all that has happened and not all that will happen but we are addressing it so with my optimistic hat on i think you know this has come at us very fast very recently and we actually are getting our skates on to do something about it and that partly comes from um you know our sense of uh uh us in in conflict with nature which is something which in, ingrained as i say i think we're gonna have to get beyond that but it has helped us understand we really are doing damage and we really do need to do something about it mm -hmm. okay
And so, these, as a journalist, the terms that we use do they do they are, are they changing slightly too? Aren't they? You talk there about net zero, which nobody's heard of, sort of, you know. Well, well, that's right. And uh, I mean, Jim, and we still talk about claim, climate change, but some people want to call that climate emergency. Well, well yeah. Like, when I started, it was the greenhouse effect, and it was global warming. And we, I mean, now it's then it became climate change, and now we talk about the climate emergency, or at least we do because the Guardian decided it wanted to talk about the climate <laughs> emergency. If you, I mean, you could you can date it to the day when they run it, run a leader on the front page saying we're going to talk about climate emergency now. Mm. no that's fine i mean you know i'm with that it is an emergency that's so let's mm. so yes language does matter mm. um but uh, i don't go overboard about i mean you know we kind of know what the issues are yeah, yeah. um we we can use different I mean, people will try and mess with the language i mean some people will try and change the language in order to persuade us that it's not really that important mm. but i think i think kind of we get it Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that's again, that's good news. We are actually um, getting something which, in many ways, is rather abstract. In many ways, is rather distant from most of our lives. I mean, I don't get up every morning and look out the window and see climate change. Yeah, I probably have to look at a graph to remember. Yeah, well, okay, things are changing a little bit, but maybe, mm -hmm. and to realise that that's not an entirely natural phenomenon. Mm. So I'm quite surprised. It, I mean, this is this is me talking about having writing about it too long, probably. But I mean, <laughs> I, I'm I'm kind of surprised about how far we've got. Yeah, that doesn't mean we fixed it. It doesn't even mean that we will fix it. Yeah. But we have a shot at it. Yeah. Oh. So uh, a question that came in from uh, to to ask the the panel, which I probably should be to Emma, because she'll she'll know, oh, no. is, uh, is have we reflected the history of climate change denial? Is there other other <laughs> counter arguments within the collection? There are actually. Um, so the one that springs to mind is with regards to the greenhouse effect, um, turn of the nineteenth century. There's a there's a sort of a group of scientists um, such as Svante Arrhenius and Niels Ekholm, um, a few in Sweden and uh, also independently actually in America. And they're all approaching the same conclusion, the greenhouse effect from slightly different angles. Um, but the progress, so they, and there's one particular paper that gets set forth as a suggestion that this is in fact a real thing that is happening and we have data on it. Um, and a leading, a leading scientist on the other side says, no, I disagree. And these are the reasons why. And that actually sets back the progress on um, sort of establishing the greenhouse effect for about 20 years until the early 20th century when it gets Sort of brought up again in another paper where they say you know we can't forget about this you need to look at this data again this is a real thing um so i think on the scientific side of it it is quite well um represented that that sort of you know it, it's not a, it's not a smooth path right it, mm. it's been and and it can't be it's a difficult yeah. issue and it requires a lot of thought and uh, a lot of data has built up around it so yeah, the science in particular, it's great to you have a pamphlet from one person, the response from another and here and there. And it's not it's not an easy fight to have one to get to the conclusions that we have today. No. I think for a long time it was thought of as something in the future. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, you know, back end of the 21st century, maybe we'll, it'll start to be an issue. And scientists sort of framed everything in, well, in 100 years time, this all that will happen. So it wasn't really until the back end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, that people started saying, no, it's not the future. We, we can measure it. It's happening now. We can see it. Um, and, there's, and then they started trying to predict how, how fast will it happen. And what, what I find amazing about, about Arrhenius, whose who's great work you've, you've got in the collection, done more than 100 years ago, is that he... One Christmas Eve, he'd fallen out with his wife. It was as simple as that. He had nothing to do. And, you know, some of us might have gone down to the bar or got, or got very maudlin or, or, you know, we would have different responses. His response was, as a, as a chemist, was to say, you know, there's that thing I was going to think about, that sort of the greenhouse effect thing. And he wanted to work out how big an effect it would have. So we sat down literally for a couple of weeks and just did the calculations. Well, in the Arctic, it'll be this. And, and, he, and he basically... The climate models that we have now with the supercomputers say more or less exactly the same thing as what he said with a pen and paper and a couple of weeks' work back then. So it wasn't, it was never really rocket science, but we always, he thought it was, actually, he thought it might be quite a good thing, global warming, brilliant, you know. But he, I mean, he was living in Sweden, Sweden so maybe, yeah. you know. Uh, so he thought, you know, 
brilliant. Um, and for a lot of time, a long time, most of the time since then, people have thought, thought wow, well, yeah. it's really, again, it's really very recent that we've suddenly been confronted with something with it. Can I comment on that for a sec? Please do. Um, well, it, one of the problems, uh, Arrhenius was sort of around the turn of the century, I think his first paper was in 96, 1896. Um, there was another gentleman who was a very famous scientist also at that time named Newt Angstrom, uh, who was the son, I believe, of Anders Angstrom, who everybody has probably heard of as one of the guys who uh, figured out how to use telescopes and uh, determine what uh, spectrum were. Uh, he, he proved Arrhenius wrong, and or at least everybody thought he did for 20 or 30 years. He, he said uh, that, uh, that the various uh, greenhouse gases uh, got over, they, they overlapped with water and therefore they didn't add, it, add uh, uh, warming onto that and so on. And, and it wasn't until the 1930s uh, that scientists actually attacked that and restarted that whole thing. It didn't, you know, there was a period of 30 years where nothing went on. Um, and then finally by uh, the mid seventies uh, there, and I, I, I don't wanna get into this other stream of, of, of analysis of, of uh, science, but two, there were two different streams of science. One says it's gonna cool down and the other one says it's gonna warm up. And it wasn't until they confronted that difference of opinion in the mid 70s when Time Magazine would say it's cooling and then Newsweek would say we don't know uh, that they finally got together and started modeling together and came to some conclusions over the next 20 years about what the real answer was. It's very complicated and it took that, that synthesis of the two uh, uh, areas of, of research to, to come up with, a, with an answer that everybody could agree to. So I have a, another question from a, a, um, a user, Sam, uh, who, who is asking really about that question is it, what you've just been talking there about is the sort of the time difference between an understanding and public acceptance of that. So the scientific understanding, and even if it's only 20, 30 years or so, is that time enough? That's the question. Are we, are, are we moving sufficiently fast? Dan, what do you? Are we moving sufficiently fast? <laughs> Um, I think we're moving in the right direction. Whether we're moving fast enough is a different matter. Mm. So we know that the Paris commitments, um, we, we have to hit a certain thing, and we, you know, we have to hit this one and a half degrees, but our current rate, we're nowhere near that. So unless we do something really quickly and we get the acceptance of many more people mm. to really understand the issues, you know, and what we need to do is we need to get this across in a way where people understand it. People understand actually what is quite a, on the surface, quite a simple thing to, to, to kind of get your head around, but we need to put it in a way where they can understand it and they feel like they can do something. Because mm -hmm. in a moment, this um, there's this fear and it feels too big. It feels too big for people to do something about. Yeah. So we have to make it simple. We have to see, we also have to make it so people understand how it affects them personally. Because at that point, then they will they will buy into it mm -hmm. and they will get on board with what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, what is it? They say that we've got 10 years before we're on the, we're past the tipping point um, of catastrophic climate change. So we've got this short window. Um, we are moving in the right direction, but whether we're moving quick enough is, you know, I want to be optimistic. <laughs> you know, I want to be positive about it. Um, but yeah. I don't, I don't think there is a, there isn't a total, like a tipping point where it's too late. Yeah. There, there isn't a moment at which it's too late to do anything about climate. Climate change is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse, and it won't be 1.5 or 3 or 4 or 7. You know, the temperature is going to carry on up until we stop the emission of, yeah. of, uh, of, of CO2 into the atmosphere, basically. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to do it. But, um, the point being that the, 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 it, it, it accumulates. So every tonne that you put in, well, some of it just is disappears into nature very quickly, but the rest of it sticks around and sticks around and accumulates and builds up. And that's why the lines on the graph are doing that. Um, so we've got to, you know, we've got to stop doing it. We've simply got to stop burning those fossil fuels yeah. and putting that gas into the atmosphere. The only question is how much damage we've done before we manage to do that. 
You know, can we stop at 1.5? I'd be very surprised yeah. if we did. Can we stop at two? Some people say that if everybody, everything that was done in Glasgow uh, was carried out, mm. big ask, um, we could stop at two. More likely, I would have say we'll get up towards three and that will have very serious climate implications in many ways. And that will perhaps hopefully make us work hard. But we're going to have to do it. The only, as I say, the only question. So my optimism comes from the fact that we are developing the technologies that we have to do it. I'm not quite with you when you say, well, we have. I mean, I, we, yes, everybody has to get on board with this, I suppose. But actually, there are some technical fixes out there, and the scientists who've been worrying about for climate change for 20, 30 years have been working on those, working to develop the technologies that we can get our energy in different ways. So, um, you know, maybe there are technical fixes. Maybe everybody else can sort of yeah, so I don't, live their I, lives. And, I don't think there's um, kind of know. one 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 <laughs> solution that is one one answer to this. So, yes, I, I'm in agreement. It's it's going to take a, a response from how we act and how we, you know, and what we do personally. We also need policy change from governments. Yeah, the political you know, pressures. We need those political yeah. pressures. We also, and we need those technologies to help as well. But I think is that what we can't be is reliant on one thing. I think is if this is where we need to have many of these different aspects to give us that chance to, mm. to do what we need to do. But unless we start to put pressure on people and on governments to say, well, actually, we want these technologies, we want these technologies to be used, um, you know, to supply our energy and our power, we want to stop using fossil fuels. Um, you know, unless we start to put that pressure on, you know, then then it won't happen. Yeah, well, that, that yeah. I agree. I mean, yeah. we're, we're going to have to demand that our governments deliver yeah, on it. So we're going to have to demand that our corporations deliver yeah, on it, Sarah, and not buy their stuff if they don't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's the pressure, point we have to play. Consumer pressure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, thank you. We've uh, we allotted uh, an hour for this, so we, <laughs> we chewed up a lot of time, which is great. Um, so uh, I just wanted to throw it out to the room. If anybody here has any questions that we haven't tackled or anything they wanted to ask yeah thank you thank you for a great discussion and it's interesting that you brought up the earth site which i think kicked off literally on the 3rd of june 1992 so it's mm. 30 years i've known many ones that was actually there so be great. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting old and rare <laughs> experience but um another reflection i think is that there's a long list of overlooked female scientists in history um, Rosalind Franklin, mm. perhaps Rachel Carson, but Eunice Foote is someone who appears in the collection. Mm. So it'd be great to hear <laughs> about her work and the piece that you've got in your collection as well. Yes, I am her most fervent uh, champion at the moment. But um, but yes, so the, um, and the question was just in, in case uh, the live audience didn't hear, but it was about the significance of Eunice Newton Foote and sort of the wider question of female scientists and their contributions um, to the history of these things. And so, yes, Eunice Newton Foote is a fascinating figure. Um, she really has only been rediscovered in and her place in climate history um, has been sort of yeah, properly identified in the last 10 years or so. Um, so there was a, it was a, yeah, a, a paper, an academic paper came out about 10 years ago, which said, you know, oh, I was looking into Tyndall as the sort of the, the forefather of all of this discussion on uh, the greenhouse effect. And I found a paper um, published by the American Association that is from 1856 and that predates him by several years. And this paper was written by uh, Mrs. Foote. And it's been great to sort of watch the subsequent discoveries from that um, as people looked into her further, um, as it was sort of discovered that in fact, yes, even though her paper is only two pages um, long, it is incredibly important in, in what it discovers. And it doesn't come to the complete conclusion um, that Tyndall does uh, a few years later, but it is certainly a very key point uh, in the history of understanding the greenhouse effect. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of work still to be done on her. So for example, there was a great, there's been a great sort of Twitter campaign over the years to actually find a photograph of her because no one knows what she looked like or anything about her. Um, 
sort of her wider life. I mean, she was a um, she, you know, campaigned uh, for the vote and so on. But um, but it's very difficult to find a photo. So occasionally people say, oh, look, here it is. And it turns out to be her daughter or a niece or so and so. So there's still a ways to go. Was she, was she forgotten? I mean, did, did, the, did the male scientists steal all her ideas and, and, and present them as their own? Or, or was her work literally forgotten and only rediscovered? Um, I know? think it was the latter. So there's a great mm. paper on this um, by someone called Roland, last name I forget, but he does a great uh, article on foot Tyndall on the question of priority. And it's very good at explaining just that. And it's... Um, it talks about the fact that actually the criticism that has been levied against people like Tyndall is that they knew about this paper, but they mm. just sort of didn't draw attention to it. And actually the conclusion that he comes to in his article is that, you know, the likelihood of this two page paper having made it across the ocean, um, the fact that it wasn't even read out loud by her in the first place. Um, one of her colleagues did it on her behalf. And the fact that she didn't have the same uh, connections within that academic scientific community. Um, there was one review, I think, in England of the paper, which was sort of a little a little a side note almost on a larger article. Um, so that concludes, and I think it is fair to say that the work wasn't stolen, but it was just presented in a way that meant that it wouldn't get very far and that it was sort of a um, like an origin paper. It didn't come to a grand conclusion where it stated this is absolutely what is meant. It put forward the findings and said there's more to be done here. And I think that's why it didn't get the traction that that it now does, because we're interested in these things now about tracing these little bits of information to the uh, the origin point, as it were. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the floor? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been really fascinating, and um, I'm a part of the climate science uh, community, and I haven't heard of this collection until today when I walked in <laughs> to look at your science books. Um, and the range of, of presentations you've given are really interesting from an arts and history of science, a little bit about the building up of the science. And then there's there's been some very interesting comments about the predicament we're in now, which I'm finding slightly con contradictory. But where do you think this collection can go in, in really, can it help um, widen the appreciation of the uh, emergency that we face and the actions we must take? Or is it going to remain a history art focus? Mm. Um, I think that the collection has a lot of potential, um, as you've noted, with the sort of focus on the arts and the literature as well as the science, um, to invite a response on lots of different levels. And I think that's what one of the things about it that works really well is that no matter your perspective coming into it, whether that be as a skeptic, whether that be as someone who's interested purely in the science or as someone who's come from a more activist standpoint on it, there is a strand of inquiry in the collection that you can latch onto and sort of get to grips with. And then from that, it's sort of an entry point into the larger debate. So I would hope that um, that there is potential in the collection to sort of continue these conversations and perhaps, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a one size fits all answer, but to sort of continue these conversations in a slightly different sphere. So, you know, we're talking about a rare books collection. There is an extent to what we can do, right, <laughs> in terms of mitigating the causes, but I think it does draw important links between things and hopefully and i think this bears out in the conversations that i've had with people since it went on exhibition and since it was put out there that you know people come to it from from one point of view and leave thinking about different names or they leave thinking about a different concept or a different way of seeing things and i'm hoping that that's that's something that the collection can do actively uh, within its own sphere and that even if the um responses that come out of it are different. That's sort of a natural byproduct of having so many voices 
happen not just in its history but also in the present moment so I like, I like the diversity of voices that show up I mean we have everything from posters to comic strips to uh you know to science to literature and it's always I mean as a, I'm a science journalist so I probably shouldn't say this but I, I do sometimes say to scientists shut up stop talking we need climate if we're going to you know address climate change properly it can't be done in the voice of science or science is part of it but it can't be the only voice in which it's in which it's done and I find that sort of media people if you want somebody to talk about climate change you bring on a scientist I said well why why not bring a theologian or an author or a filmmaker or, or you know almost anybody but a scientist sometimes <clears throat> because we need the different voices the different ways of thinking about things the different framing of things the different emotional context of things and if it's you know if it is a, as as you've been saying a sort of a society endeavor that that we all have to be part of or, or at least we all have to sign off on even if we're not all sort of vanguardist environmentalists then it has to encompass as many people as possible and be done in as many voices as possible and it seems you know I, I think that's really important now and I think that's probably one of the most important things to say about the collection is that it shows the diversity it reflects the diversity of voices that can be brought to it. I, I, agree with everything you've just said so I, I spend my entire day every day taking reports and information from the scientists that I work with and me and my team then put that <coughs> out to different audiences in different ways because we, we have to speak to people in different ways and I think the collection really does that incredibly well um, there's some really fascinating things in, in that collection whether it's just purely from a visual point of view um, but you know, I, I've gone away from it with new people that I that I haven't heard of before, you know, and I've read more about that. But just having having all of those different angles in, which is what we need to do, is we just need to bring people in from different ways and and you know find out what works for them. Yes. Um, I wonder if you found in the collection, or what's the earliest record of climate denial? So I know you mentioned. Uh, scientific rebuffing of mm. climate ideas, but something which is much more sort of, if you like, politically driven. And in that respect, I was wondering, even if some of the very early scientific discoveries were questioned as when science was sort of being questioned as a, as a kind of a, a discipline and a practice. Mm. Thinking on the fly. Mm. I don't suppose, Dave, did you hear that question? It has to do with climate deniers early on is that what you're saying yes yeah, so we're thinking about sort of early climate denial but not necessarily just the scientific response call and response but also the the political the sort of the way in which science was perhaps um yeah shown to be in well, the am i getting that correct yeah. sort of roughly around that yeah, uh, sort of, yeah. um, from so the i think there's always um there's always denial on every new scientific idea. Uh, the denial that I think was strongest uh, in the public uh, vein in the beginnings of the study of climate was on the other side, which is people who couldn't believe possibly that there had been glaciers all the way down to the water and that uh, all of Europe had had an ice age before that. They just said, that we can't believe that. And so there was a lot of a lot of resistance to that. I think the other side, the other group, the people who are doing the greenhouse effect, uh, that denial has been more recent. I think it's been more of a scientific endeavor between physicists disagreeing with the science with each other. Uh, and maybe only since uh, the 60s has it been, uh, people have been writing publicly about it and, and trying to build public opinion around both of those, around that, that, that uh, uh, point of view. And certainly it's grown much since around the 90s when uh, IPCC was saying it's happening and all of a sudden people who saw the uh, Time magazines and uh, Newsweek magazines from back in 1975 said, well, wait a minute, how can we possibly be that sure? Because we, we, we were arguing with each other, scientists were arguing with each other 25 years ago, how can we be that sure? So I think a lot of it has been more recent in terms of the uh, 
uh, climate change through the greenhouse effect. I think that was earlier on the other side. Thanks, One book in the collection, which is on Noah's flood. Yes. Does that argue theology against science or in that? Mm, yes, so the Diluvian flood, that sort of period where, Dave, when we're talking about glaciation and that theory being set forth for the many ice ages, but the response in geology was that this is in fact, the, like very, put it very broadly, that there was there was now geological evidence that Noah's flood had happened. And so that's the sort of counterpoint as well. Um, Dave, were you about to say something? I, I you know, I, I think all that was developing. Um, I, I can recall uh, when uh, I think Charles Lyell came to the rescue of Charles Darwin because people thought that the world had only been around for much less time than it would take evolution to, to do what Darwin was saying it would do. So there have been deniers of you know, evolution. There still are. Um, scientists are pretty firm now that they believe that that is actually the driving force. Um, I just think it's, uh, it's a part of, you know, anytime there's a major paradigm shift uh, brought by science, it takes a long time for the average person to uh, agree with it, especially if their religion says that they shouldn't. And just to link it back to the politics that you mentioned, sir, um, the only the one thing that I can think of, and it's not a fully formed thought, but um, there's a, an article by Benjamin Franklin from the 1780s where he talks about meteorological conjectures and sort of and talks about climate being affected by natural disasters in particular. Um, but a lot of his work on climate was, as we previously discussed, actually talking about this change as a positive thing. And that was often in support of the fact that agricultural reform in America was particularly important at that time and a very big instigator of trade. And so it was much more important to frame that as a positive change and therefore could enact certain reforms than to see the negatives in it. And that's I would need to look into that further, but that's the 1780s. So, um, as a early uh, political thing, yeah. Sorry, uh, I think I think these days skeptics are often scientists in their own particular silo, looking at the world from a very particular standpoint. So, I mean, as a journalist coming across the climate skeptics and having to report on them from time to time, which I've certainly done, it seemed to me that they often came from two perspectives. There were the geologists, <coughs> excuse me who saw things on time frames of millions of years. And in millions of years, all the CO2 we put in the atmosphere will go into the ocean or be absorbed by geology. So in geolo geological timescales, yeah, maybe it doesn't matter. And the other group are the meteorologists who are looking at things on very, very short time frames. I said, well, you, you know, we, know you, we can see, we can forecast weather, weather does this, you know, blah, blah. we don't need these long-term climate things to, to, so they're looking at from a very short time scale. And then you get another group of people who are perhaps looking at solar spots, sunspots and solar cycles. And, and for each of them, they have their own specialism and it's not really important. Um, so the question is, which is, you know, which is the perspective which is most important to us? And it seems like climate change is really important over timescales of decades to hundreds of years, perhaps to thousands of years. And those are, you know, that's what matters to us, surely. So I think, uh, you know, there's a certain, certain academic blindness that gets in among some, certainly some, what we'd call skeptics. I mean, they're, they're deniers more than skeptics, but, you know, skepticism is good. Denialism, I think, is, is uh, bad. And on that, I think we should probably uh, call, call an end to this. So I wanted to say thank you very much to uh, Dave Wenner, our collector. I, I missed, actually, I wanted to hear his uh, stories. Um, I consider him the Indiana Jones of, uh, of uh, pamphlet finding. I wanted to <laughs> find out how he wormed his way into those warehouses to get that last issue of Nature or something like that. Um, thank you also to Emma, who uh, is uh, from Peter Harrington, Emma Walsh. And uh, we have Fred Pierce here, uh, the uh, science writer, and Dan Bradbury, who joined us at the last minute, yeah. as it were, from the World Land <laughs> Trust. So yeah. thank you very much for that. And thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs>